Welcome to The Creator's Adventure, where we interview creators from around the world hearing their stories about growing a business. My name is Brian McAnulty. I'm the founder of Heights Platform, and today I'm talking with Jacqueline Gallo about how to be more confident on camera, how you can teach others using metaphors, and how to design a business around the life that you want to live. All right. Hey, everyone. So we're here today with Jacqueline Gallo. She is a life coach and a keynote speaker and best-selling author. She started her business at the age of 21 from her dorm room, and she's passionate about helping women create lives that they love. And today she's spoken at over 125 corporations, conferences, and universities in seven countries, including being a TEDx speaker. So Jacqueline, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me here. Yeah, so my first question for you is that um, you help women create a life that they love and start their dream business. So what is the most common reason or struggle that they have that they're coming to you for? I think it's a deep inner knowing that most people, whether male or female, have had since they were a child. It's this knowing that they were meant to do big things in the world. It starts to develop more and more as you age, depending on your experiences. So I know for me, I remember being a kid and we would be on vacation. We went on vacation once a year to the beach in New Jersey, the Jersey shore. And we would stay in a house, you know, far away from the beach, a small house that was tight. A lot of us, what my parents could afford, it was wonderful. And I used to tell my parents when we were walking down the boardwalk at night, I'm going to buy you one of those houses right on the beach, these huge mansions. And I would be like six years old and they're like, that's great, Jacqueline, we hope so. And it's funny because all of the women that I work with, they have these big visions that they've maybe had since they were kids. And it's just this inner knowing. And as you go through life and have different experiences and particularly women who wanna build businesses, especially if they've worked in corporate America or in a typical nine to five job, this voice, this deep inner knowing, it starts to get louder and louder and louder until it becomes something that you just can't ignore anymore. And sometimes it might be world events like a pandemic that have really shaped someone to say, wow, I need to do this or losing a loved one, something that puts your life into perspective and gives you permission that was always there, but you had to lean into it to actually follow the dream that's been inside. So I would say that's the biggest thing. Awesome. That's great. Um, and so you do public speaking, um, you've uh, done a TEDx talk, and um, is this something that you felt like you've always been good at speaking to a crowd? Um, and if it is, or even if it's not, what would you say to help like a new creator or new business owner feel comfortable and confident uh, on camera? I love that question. It is something that I've always felt that I was good at. And I think that we all have those unique gifts and talents. And that's why we're here in the world creating. And so that's why I've leaned into that one. And I also believe that we can always improve our skill set, become better so that we can have more of an impact. So I've definitely studied public speaking and how I can improve on those natural gifts and talents. And on top of that, it's very different to speak live on a stage than it is to speak on a camera. So it's actually a lot easier for me to speak on a stage than it is for me to speak into a camera. So when I gave my TEDx talk, it was in the middle of the pandemic. It was actually scheduled for, I think, March 20th, 2020. Mm -hmm. And of course they postponed it to August. It was gonna be in person in August. Of course they had no idea what the pandemic was gonna look like, how it was gonna unfold. So when we got to August, they decided we're gonna make it virtual. So what that meant was I got to come in person and record my talk to a room with the two event creators were in the room and I think two, uh, two uh, cameras and that was it. And I had to speak directly into the camera, which was really difficult. So I'll give tips on both because I think both are important for creators. So if you're speaking live to an audience, first thing that's really important, and this also applies to the camera, no one knows what you're supposed to say. So as long as you appear confident, and you continue to talk, it's okay if you pause. Pausing is natural. We're humans, we need to breathe. No one really notices the pauses. Given that you keep going, no one will know what you had intended to say, so nobody knows if you mess it up. That being said, one of the biggest game changers for me with speaking 
was not memorizing a script, which did not apply for my TEDx talk because we were required to memorize a script. So that really <laughs> threw a wrench in it. But typically when I give keynotes, when I'm on podcasts, I know my main points. I know my stories. I know my life. I know the things I'm passionate about. So I don't need to memorize a script. The problem with memorizing a script, and I learned this by actually trying to memorize the script and giving a lot of speeches where I looked like a deer in headlights in the middle of the talk is that you try to remember the exact words. And when you can't remember, you freeze. So instead, if you have an outline, if you have bullet points, if you say, I'm going to start with this story, I'm going to make these main points, and then I'm going to end with this story, you can't really mess up because you, you know the story if you lived it. So that's a really helpful tip, both for on camera and on stage. The other thing that's really helpful, and if you're on stage, you can record yourself on your phone. If you're on camera, you can obviously watch the recording, is to listen back. I still do this to this day. And bring awareness in a really loving way to areas of growth. So for a lot of people, it's filler words like, um, you know, you don't hear yourself saying them when you speak because they're probably coming from your subconscious mind. It's a habit. It's how a lot of people speak. So you probably heard that at a young age when people were speaking. These are words that people use in their sentences. However, they're not helpful in public speaking and they do decrease the quality of your talk. And the ideal is to say them rare, very rarely, if at all. So when I first started speaking, I noticed that I said them all the time. I'm still human. And sometimes I say them, but I say them significantly less than I did when I first started. And the way that I worked on that was I would record my talk. And after it, I would write a list of the filler words I used and I would tally how many times I used them. So if it was an hour long keynote, I might've really said like bringing perspective to it a hundred times. And then I would measure, okay, next week I gave another keynote for an hour. And I said like only 75 times. And then I said like only 50 times. And the awareness was key. When I focused on it, when I brought conscious awareness to the fact that these filler words were distracting me, then I said them less. Now I wouldn't start there. So if you're like, I can't even get in front of an audience, let alone remove filler words, just start where you are. The first step might be speak for a full 20 minutes without freezing for more than 10 seconds in the middle of your talk, right? So meet yourself where you are. If you're on camera and you're working on delivering on camera, this is especially relevant for course creators because we yep. are delivering our courses on camera, whether that's you're filming into your laptop, maybe you've hired a camera crew. I recommend looking at a real person if possible. So whether if it's a camera right in front of your face, don't stare into the camera. If you have the person filming standing right next to it, looking into their eyes, speaking to them, it makes it a lot more comfortable. If it's on your laptop, it doesn't feel as intimidating because it's not a huge camera. So it's not as scary. I do recommend if you're filming it yourself and you can do as many takes as you want, force yourself to do it in one take. Say, I'm going to start, I'm going to pretend it's live and I'm going to keep going. And if you're someone who feels like you can't do that, maybe actually teach it live, maybe actually get an audience. Maybe it's a group of people who are interested in your work and are going to show up for free. You can teach it live, record it and then use those recordings. Because if you're doing it as many takes as you possibly can give yourself, it will, it will never be perfect and you'll never release your content and the world needs your material. So lots of tips on public speaking, look at where you're at in your journey and take what you need. But those are the ones that have helped me the most. Awesome. Yeah. I think that's uh, super helpful because definitely we've noticed that like a lot of creators are nervous about getting on video for the first time if they're not already like a youtuber or or making these sales videos or making even instagram videos it's something that's hard to to build a habit at getting comfortable with and definitely the point about the script i think that you mentioned is super powerful because having the script like it's it's hard for anyone to not mess that up a million times but if you're just telling your story and telling the things that you know, you're just, it's just like you're talking to someone about it. You don't have to memorize it. You're saying, saying this is the thing I'm going to talk about. And it, it makes it a whole lot easier. And I really like that tip too of doing it live instead, because that forces you to just talk about it as you would talk about it. And now you've got something that you can use as 
that first video. Um, Cause definitely like we've seen the biggest thing that holds creators back from actually being successful is not because like their content's not good enough. It's because they don't get it out there. So getting it out there is that, uh, that most important step. Um, so along those lines, you offer coaching, online courses, you wrote a book and you do the public speaking. So what are your favorite ways of communicating with your customers or clients? And what do you feel that you do that offers the most value to your clients or customers? Mm, I love that question. I feel the best way of communicating is using storytelling and metaphors. So those are my two secret sauces that I incorporate a lot, whether it's my stories, stories of clients, stories that I've read in books. I am obsessed with learning. So I spend hours every single day reading books, listening to podcasts about these same concepts that I teach and metaphors are really powerful. It's how our subconscious mind works. And so 95% of our behavior is coming from our subconscious mind, meaning we don't realize we're doing it. A few examples of this that most people can relate to. If you've ever gotten in your car and you've driven somewhere, maybe you weren't even intending to go there. I've done this many times. I'm supposed to be going to a coffee meeting. Somehow I've driven to my high school. I am many years out of high school, but somehow I still drive there because my mind still remembers that road and constantly going that direction. So I don't realize I'm doing it. It's totally coming from my subconscious. Another example, somebody asks, hey, what's your password to that thing? Maybe your friend, you're giving them your Netflix login and you're like, what is my Netflix password? You're like, just give me the computer, I'll type it. And you can actually type it in yourself. Your fingers know the way, mm -hmm. but you couldn't consciously recall the password. So this is our subconscious mind. And it's kind of scary that your subconscious mind is creating 95% of your waking day-to-day -day life. Essentially, we're living the majority of our life, not really awake, but determined by our patterns, our habits, these neural pathways that our brain has created, and the, these this chemical makeup inside our body by the thoughts that we continue to think, the feelings we continue to feel. So in order to create real change in your life, it's important to work with your subconscious mind. And this is one of the reasons why New Year's resolutions don't work for a lot of people. They say they're going to go to the gym. They've consciously made this decision. They haven't changed anything in their subconscious. Therefore, they stop going after two weeks, three weeks. So metaphors are one way where we can actually directly communicate with our subconscious. So I often, and you've probably heard already, or you will hear throughout this conversation, naturally bring metaphors into my teaching because I know that it's going to create a change on a deeper level, which is going to create massive impact in people's lives. So that's really big. I would say the thing that I do the most for my clients is I help make really big, unrealistic dreams real. It's something I've always been good at. Again, I believe we all have natural gifts and talents. And if you're listening to this, I know that you have natural gifts and talents and you are pursuing them. And I love that. My natural gift is to take these really big things that seem out of reach. I was often told as a kid that my head was in the clouds and I thought, what a blessing. What a blessing that things that other people think are unrealistic are impossible. I see is so possible and I can break them down and be crazy enough to believe in myself or believe in the people around me, the women in my circle, my clients, women in my mastermind, my students, believe in them enough to know that they can do it too. Even if it seems crazy, even if it's one in a million. So that's what I like to bring to the table and what I hope to leave you with today. Cool. Yeah. I think that's awesome. I think that's really important and helping other people get to that point is uh, really great. Um, I, I feel that I, I had a little bit of that as well um, growing up and starting my business. My philosophy has always been, well, thinking to myself and asking, why can't I do this? Mm -hmm. And if you ask yourself that, oftentimes you can't really come up with a legitimate answer. So then why not actually go and try to do that? So good. Or your answer is a silly limiting belief. Like I'm afraid yeah. of what this person will think or and it's like, well, why would I allow that to hold me back? It, yeah, it's not it's not a real reason that would actually should actually be stopping you um, if you actually think about it. Um, so if you would go back in time then and start um, from the day that you created your business, is there anything that you would have done differently um, if you were doing that again today? I have to say no and yes, which I know is silly, but everything in life is kind of that 
polar opposite and we can hold both? No, because every decision created a lesson which shaped me into the teacher I am today to have the experience I have today so that I can share with others. However, there are definitely things that I wish I knew. There's so many. I could fill hours and hours and hours. I'll, I'll pick a few. So the first one is I would have gotten clear on what I wanted for my life instead of what I wanted for my business first. So I would have designed a business around the life I wanted to live and my personal values rather than a business, rather than a, okay, I'm getting this backwards. So most, most people, they have a business and that's their number one focus. And then the life has to fit in around it. So picture a puzzle. Here's the metaphor, a giant puzzle, right? And your business is a really big part of the puzzle and it's filling like almost 80%. And then just around it is life. And life has to fit into these small pieces in the shapes that they're there. I would do the opposite. I would make life the 80 and business the 20. And I would make business fit into the life I want it to live. It doesn't mean that business needs to actually only take 20% of the time. If you love your work and you want to work lots of hours, absolutely. What I'm getting at here is that when I first started, I thought more about what was going to make me successful, what was going to make money and less about what I wanted for my life, what I was good at, what my values were. And I kind of just threw myself into any idea I had. And I'm so glad I did that because I started and I believe starting somewhere is the most important step because that's going to get you to where you want to go. But if I went back or if I could give advice to those who are earlier in their journey, I would really zoom out and think, what kind of life do I want to live? What are my values? What do I want work to look like? What am I passionate about? And start there and then think about what type of business do I want to run and how is it going to fit into my life and what steps can I take? as I'm building it today to set it up for the success I want. So that would be a really big one. And then outside of that, I think the third thing that I would have done is I would have built my self-confidence earlier. I would have realized that I was capable of so much more sooner. If I could have like knocked myself over the head and went back in time and said, hey, why are you so stuck on this thing? It doesn't matter and look where you can go and look what's possible for you because everything shifted for me. And there have been multiple moments of this where I realized, oh, wow, I'm capable of this thing. I'm going to go do it now. Essentially, I would have done the things I wanted to do from the beginning. Instead of telling myself that I need to do these seven stepping stones first, I would have just done them now because you're already capable. You're already good enough. If the desire is on your heart, go for it. You're going to figure it out along the way. So those would be the biggest things. Great. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. It, a lot, oftentimes the, um, so the shortcut to that is that realization because oftentimes it's not actually, there isn't actually a, a progression of something that's necessary to get you to the point. You're already actually able to do it. It's just, it takes time to realize that. Um, I like that. And, and what you said again about figuring out that idea that fits for your life and structuring your life around it instead of the business first. I think that's a great point too, because everybody gets stuck in thinking, well, how can I make money? And that's the first thing. And so people get into the trap of working on that first thing that makes them any kind of money. And then some people, unfortunately, never are able to shift out of that. They're never mm -hmm. able to figure out, well, what, do, what would I actually enjoy? And they just get stuck in doing that one thing because that's what they figure out makes them money and that's, that's what they do. But the... The shortcut basically, and what you're saying is you can do those other things first. And it's important that you just try something because then you'll actually make progress. But if you think about that earlier, then you might be able to give yourself a shortcut and find something that you actually can enjoy doing. You actually can feel that you're making a positive impact with and then be able to start on that earlier. But as long, don't think about it too long, right? Because you don't want to um, stop yourself from starting. 100% couldn't agree more. You said it so perfectly. Cool. Um, so you started your business while you were 21 years old. You were still in college. Um, how do you feel that your age and experience at the time affected your success? And what would you say to someone else who's younger 
who is 21 now maybe, um, or anywhere close to that, where they're feeling that maybe they're a little bit scared because their lack of experience or lack of money, they feel like is holding them back? I feel like it was a blessing to start at a young age because while I was failing, I wasn't really missing out on much. Like I was missing out on my friends who had an average job with an entry-level paycheck. Cool. I got to trade that for so much experience in failing, figuring out what was going to work and what wasn't and building my resilience, which was huge. And when you're young, people want to help you. It's like a beautiful blessing, especially in college. So I feel like when you're young, you might as well start because there are so many people who want to help you and you are in this place where if you truly fail, which I believe is impossible because truly failing is giving up. But if you were to give up and say, this isn't for me, you can just get a job. You can just start, pick back up life where you left off and you're not going to miss much. So I believe that it was really powerful to start when I was young and yeah, it stinks that you don't have a lot of money, but money can be created, right? So there's lots of creative ways. Um, I waitressed on campus and saved up my money. I borrowed a little bit for my parents. I raised money on Kickstarter. I won a pitch contest. I used credit cards. I did whatever I could to get the money I needed to put my business in a position where I could achieve my goals. So that was huge. And I would encourage people to start as young as possible. And also if you're listening and you're older and you're like, well, this doesn't apply to me also like it's never too late. So there's this beautiful balance of wherever you are today, start, if you haven't started already, or if you're young and you've started, but you're kind of questioning, this is the prime time. There's no better time. And it's never too late. I have clients that are in their sixties and they're killing it. So it doesn't matter either way. Know that the sooner you start, the sooner you're going to fail, the sooner you fail, the sooner you're going to learn, the sooner you learn sooner you're going to create the things you want in life. Awesome. So, yeah, so you, you keep going back to mentioning how you try these different things. You failed from different earlier experiences that you had, and it took all these different failures to really get to where you're at today. Um, so a lot of new entrepreneurs are getting discouraged from these failures that they'll have. And having even that one failure may cause them to give up because they're afraid of failing again. So, um, how did you stay positive in after you had any kind of failures as you in getting to where you got to today? Yeah. So I always say the first failure was the easiest because it's like, okay, I failed one time, but everyone fails and that's part of the process. And like, let's keep going. But after I had failed a second time, so my first failure was a product that I created that I knew was a failure pretty early on. I decided to let go of and pivot. Then I wanted to build an app. This was a much bigger failure because I had put a lot of money into it. We had beta testers using the app and it was a more public failure. I had a lot of people supporting this, a lot of mentors, and it was really difficult because I felt like I had already failed once. Now I failed again. And at this point, maybe I should just give up. Maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I don't have what it takes. And this was a pivotal moment in my life. When I was in it, I couldn't tell you why I got back up. <clears throat> but when I was writing my TEDx talk, I was writing it about courage. And I felt that in that moment, I had a lot of courage. So I went back and I studied it. And I actually went back to my old journal entries because I journal a lot. And I was able to find the exact dates of this period of time where I was in this failure. And I was able mm. to study them to see what was it about me the person who essentially had no evidence that she was going to be successful, had only failed, had had multiple failures. What was it that allowed me to pick myself back up and keep going and recommit to my dreams? But other people in that same place give up. What was the difference? Because if I could figure that out, then I could help so many people. Because the, those of us who have big dreams and big goals, we're inevitably going to have those points. They're actually beautiful, wonderful moments because they teach us the exact lessons that we need to create the life we desire. So they're actually things we're praying for. We just don't realize it. We're like, please, I want to get to this place. And it's like, here you go. Here's all the lessons you need in this failure. So I believe that everyone who has big worthwhile dreams is going to be at a pivotal moment like that in their life. 
And if I could figure out or analyze my journey and see what about me enabled me to get back up and I could help other people do it. So that's exactly what I did. And when I was looking at the journal entries, I found that they were filled with a lot of pain, obviously, a lot of frustration, a lot of sadness. And I found that throughout that pain, throughout that sadness, throughout that frustration, there were also glimmers of hope. There were sentences like, but I know I can do this, but I don't want to give up on myself. And I realized that we live in a society that pushes this concept of being fearless, of not worrying about the things you're afraid of and putting yourself out there. And those are great concepts in theory. But the truth is that we all have fear. And when you experience a failure, when you give your all to something and you show up for yourself and you're vulnerable and you put yourself out there and it doesn't go the way you wanted it to, and you've lost money and you've let people down and you're embarrassed, it sucks. And you're going to be filled with lots of negative emotions, fear being one of them. And it's not about that. What it's about is that you just have a little bit more self-belief than fear. So this is what my TEDx is about. It's called the courage equation. Courage equals belief greater than fear. So your focus needs to be building your self-belief to be greater than your fear. Now you can do that in the moment of failure. You can actually do it. Like if you're listening to this right now and you're like, I am in the middle of my low point. I'm in the middle of a failure. I'm feeling really lost. All you need to do is build enough self-belief to take one more step, just the next step. And then the next moment you can raise your self-belief enough to believe that you can take one more step. And your first step might be take care of yourself, get a good night's sleep, eat a nourishing meal, maybe have a fun night with your friends and just stop beating yourself up and being so mean to yourself, right? Do you have enough belief that you can do that? Yes. And then the next step might be, okay, you're going to look at the finances. You're going to look at the numbers. You're going to see what you need to do in order to pay your bills. You're going to make an action plan. How do you create your belief in that? Well, there's lots of strategies to build resilience. My favorite of all time is doing hard things and making that a daily consistent practice because you prove to your mind that you can handle it, that you're capable, that you're strong. So I'm a huge advocate for exercise and really physically challenging your body. I do soul cycle because I think it's so hard. And at the end of every class, I'm like, gosh, I don't know how I got through that. And then when I go tackle a giant goal in my business, I'm like, well, that's easy, right? You can take cold showers. You can uh, put yourself out there in like silly ways. So I have this one course called the seven day comfort zone challenge. And one of the challenges in it is like, go to the grocery store in your pajamas, like something that's just really uncomfortable where like, you're afraid people are going to judge you. You're afraid of what people are going to think, but you do it anyway, because you know that you can do hard things, right? So there's lots of ways you can do it and lots of fun ways that you can build your resilience. It actually can be fun, which feels really ironic, but it gets to be fun. And it's also going to be hard and it's also going to be uncomfortable, but all you need to do is raise your self-belief just a little bit more so you can take the next step over and over and over again, and you will climb out of that hole. And before you know it, you'll be chasing a big dream or a big goal again, and you might fail again, but this time you have a little bit more resilience. And I like the concept of resilience as preventative medicine. So something that you do daily, something that you build consistently so that it's there when you fail and when you get a rejection. And there's lots of mindset practices too that we could go into, but I think that the ones that I just talked about are a good place to start. Yeah, I think that's great. It's um, it's definitely a practice. One thing that I don't know if you're uh, how familiar you are with Tim Ferriss, but my I think probably my favorite thing that I've seen that he's written is he had this blog post called The Art of Letting Bad Things Happen. And mm-hmm. it's about figuring out how can you become more comfortable with more things going wrong? Because it's a it's not fully related to what you're saying, but it it really connects to it because you have to be comfortable with things may not work out the way you want. You may still fail, but if you're going to, going to become more and more successful in your business, in your life, in whatever you're doing, there's going to have to be more little things that somehow they slip through the cracks and they go wrong and even more bigger things that go wrong for you to reach those bigger goals. And so becoming comfortable with some things are not going to be perfect. Some things are going to fail, even if the bigger picture is going to work out. 
um, you have to learn to get comfort and learn to not get stuck in those, those problems that will come up. And it's, it's hard because not only do you not want to fail and you don't want to have this, this fear of letting people down, but you also probably, you care about your customers, you care about everything you're doing and you don't, you don't want anything to go wrong. But um, inevitably, something is going to go wrong, despite how hard you try. But it's, it's great to keep going. And what, what I think another thing to say about that is, like, if anything, it's scarier to do the first thing in your business and not fail at all. It's, it's scarier to the first thing you try works out perfect. And then you have no failures. Because then, like, you could make a mistake and then it all falls apart because you don't, you don't know what you're doing yet. So yeah. you haven't failed yet. So having those failures along the way helps you get to a point that you can't fail really in the future because you've learned from all of that. I love that. And I completely agree. And something that I found when going for bigger goals in my business is I had to be okay being disappointed. I had to know that if I was going to set a really big goal, sometimes I wouldn't hit it. And I had to build this level of comfort with that emotion disappointment yep. and like disappointment's not that bad. I can handle it. I'd rather be disappointed and have went for the thing I wanted than have felt unfulfilled, not going for it at all. Right. So mm -hmm. I feel like that goes really hand in hand with the Tim Ferriss concept. And I really like that. Thanks for sharing. Cool. Yeah. Um, so one other thing we want to do is we want to get our audience kind of involved in this talk. And I'm curious, um, of course, if our audience has any questions for this, they can ask you, but I'm curious if you have any questions that you would want to ask our audience. Yeah. So the question that always lights me up is hearing about your big unrealistic dreams. So I would love if you're listening, if this interview is inspiring you, if something has resonated with you, comment your big unrealistic dream. If you feel nervous commenting it, that's a good sign. It means that it's really big and it does feel unrealistic to you. And even just saying it out loud, writing it down is a huge step. And I want to celebrate you. I love manifesting for all my people and imagining all these awesome things coming into your life. So I would love to hear what your big unrealistic dream is. Cool. That's great. And then I'd like to also ask you, for you yourself, what is the most rewarding part of being a coach, would you say? Mm. I love the moments where my clients are living something they once thought was impossible for them. And it's their reality. That is the best moment in the whole world because I know that our work together has helped them expand their belief of what's possible for them. And then not only expand that belief, but then have enough self-confidence and courage to take the actions to create it. It's just one of the most beautiful things in the world. And I wish that everyone could have that experience and have the courage to pop their bubble of what the world that they think they live in and what they get to have and live a life that's better than their dreams. Awesome. All right. Well, Jacqueline, it's been so good talking with you. Um, thanks again for coming on this interview. And if anyone wants to find you, where can they find you online? Yeah. So my name is at Jacqueline double underscore Gallo on Instagram. And I'm also on the spark your light podcast. So if you love listening to this, you would love the content there too. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me.